Hello, my name is Stiley Hayward. I would like to welcome you to the Blessed Hope Ministry. We are a King James grounded family Bible study. These lessons are not to be a substitute for regular church attendance. Nightly I direct my family through the Bible by chapter and verse. We request you to join us and to study from God and His Son Jesus Christ. You may have permission to like, send, or encourage our studies with family or friends. Edification of what God has and what He desires in our life. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly divine the word of truth. You may use our studies, but I request that you do not abuse them. For YouTube videos, subscribe below for more videos. And place the thumbs up and leave a comment or email me. Thank you. Exodus 31. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, See, <laughs> that's just funny how it's See, I have called by name, and we're going to look at God calling a couple men, Bezeel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, it really nails it down, the tribe of Judah from which Christ comes. So here's one particular man of all the people of Israel. Twelve tribes. Here's one of Judah. And I, God, have filled him with the Spirit of God. There's the Holy Spirit. Now notice it is a small s. Because the Holy Spirit is not a person in the Old Testament. He never comes in to anybody. He comes on. He never indwells in anybody. A spirit of God is, you know, you just think about a spirit. Think of a vapor. All right. What's the Holy Ghost? Well, when you think of a ghost, what do you think of? When you think of something that's got eyes and kind of like hands, Holy Ghost takes on the form of what a man looks like. In wisdom, and in understanding, and knowledge. Knowledge is what you know. I know how to drive a car. Wisdom is how to apply what you know. I get in the car, I start it up, and I go down the road. Understanding is what you know, how to use what you know in the Bible for God. I can use my license, I go pick up people and bring them to church. Or I will go to places and pass out gospel tracts. And here is one of the few places that you will find that I was, I didn't do it, but I was going to do the cross references. Wisdom, understanding, and knowledge. All three are in this man. Daniel is said, I believe, wisdom. Satan. With the Bible study, and I, I keep saying, but I've never drawn out the study. Satan's missing one of these aptitudes. I believe as Ezekiel 28 says he's wise, wisdom. It went to his head. But I would believe that he has no understanding that of God. That would be an interesting study to look out. But when you got all three of them, now, Bazil has a thing here that you see in the Gospels as he's been given a talent by God. And he can take what he knows, what he knows how to use, and is under, he could use it for himself, but he's going to turn it over for God. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall never pass away. So guess what? Bezeel's name here will never, ever disappear. It's forever written down. To devise cunning, that means good working, professional working, works. To work in gold and in silver and in brass. He's a smith. He's a jack of all trades. He's not just a goldsmith, a silversmith, and a brass worker. He's all three of them. He's a metal trades worker. 
This guy has been given the spirit of God of knowledge of these materials. Wisdom. How to use these materials. And understanding is he's going to use it for God. And cuttings of stones. So he's going to be in jewelry. To set them. And carving in timber carpentry. To work in all manner of workmanship. So God has given this man ability. And behold, now this is interesting, verse 6. I have given him a holy lab, the son of Ahashemach, of the tribe of Dan. And that is one of them squeaky tribes. He's almost like an Antichrist. He is missing amongst the 144,000 in the millennium, in the tribulation. He is the first son of Jacob that's been born of a bondwoman, Rachel's handmaid. He has been described as a serpent biting the heels of horses. And you got Judah and you got Dan working together to build this tabernacle. There's something in that, and I don't know. I'm not afraid to mention. You got Christ in verse 2, and you got the Antichrist somehow in verse 6. And in the hearts of all that are wise-hearted, so I have put wisdom, that they may make all that I have commanded thee. In the application, the women are going to spin the yarn. They're going to spin the wool. They're going to sew. They're going to do the tapestry. They're going to hammer things out. Everyone. But here are the foremen. Here's the guys that wear the white hats. They're in charge. And yet everybody has a work. These two men cannot build it all. And the tabernacle of the congregation. The ark of the testimony. And the mercy seat. That is thereupon and all the furniture of the tabernacle. How many times have we read about this? How many read it over and over? Come on God, we got it. Really, we're and we're not going to finish. We still got more to read about it. You mean you couldn't tell us God instead of telling us about the tabernacle? You couldn't tell us when Jesus did it seven years old. <clears throat> you can't tell what crafts he worked with with Joseph. You couldn't tell how people envied him growing up. That he was probably. The, the object of every mother who wanted a child like Jesus. You couldn't tell us that. You couldn't even tell us the birth date of Jesus. But you could tell us about the Passover, the date, and how long the unleavened bread feast is going to be. And the feast of Tabernacle. You could tell us that. but you. There is something to this tabernacle because God over and over and over. And we've already seen it's a pattern for the children of Israel. On their way into and in the promised land. It is a pattern of the heavens. It's a pattern that's in heaven itself. And we'll see this and we saw this in our study of Revelation. That when we finally get to heaven, this stuff is there. They open up the doors and there was the ark. I don't know how much Hollywood put into finding this Ark of the Testimony with the King James Bible. I know where it was. For uh, This Bible cost me about maybe 70 bucks. If not more. I can go down to the dollar store get me a cheap dollar fifty Bible and find out where the Ark of the Covenant is. And I don't know how many churches have gone away from what we're reading about. It's important to God. It's important to us. And the table, and his furniture, and the pure candlestick that was pure gold, I believe it was a talent, with all his furniture, and the ark of it, and the altar of incense. Now, notice how it says furniture. The table is furniture, with plates, spoons, the, the candlestick has snuffers, and those plates, and bowls, and pots. They were considered furniture too. 
and the altar of burnt offering with his with all his furniture and the labor and his foot and we go from the ark the mercy seat to the complete tabernacle the table to the candlestick and we were just hit boing 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 here and the clothes the cloths of service they're not cloth clothes yet they're cloth the holy garments for Aaron and for the priests and the garments of his sons to minister in the priest's office. The anointing oil. We're just recapping what we've been doing the last few chapters. And sweet incense. Sweet. We talked about that. That's the prayer. You're not to make anything like it. For the holy place, according to all that I have commanded thee, to, that commanded thee, shall they do. You know, God and Moses are up on the mountain right now. And God's talking to, we've seen, He's talking to Moses. He's giving Moses instructions. When Moses goes down, he's going to repeat all this again to the children of Israel. You say, well, how can Moses remember all that? You realize what we're reading right now is being recorded as God is speaking by Moses. He's writing it down. Oh, men wrote the Bible. Yeah, Moses is writing this, but God is telling them what to write. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak thou also unto the children of Israel, saying, Verily my Sabbaths ye shall keep. It is a sign between me, 1 Corinthians 1.22, The Jews require a sign. It is a sign between me and you, Moses is the representation of Gentiles. Absolutely not. He's the representation and the leader of the children of Israel. Let's look at it again. Speak thou unto the children of Israel, for it is a sign between me and you. So don't go out and call yourself a Baptist seventh day. And then put it on your sign. We're going to have a Bible study. Come on. Exodus 31 verse 13. Let's do that Bible study for one night. Shall we? And say what is the problem with that? That are That is people trying to say that Jews are no more under God. We are making the claim to God. We've got the promises of the Jews. We've got the holidays and the things of the Jews. We are spiritual Jews and God's going to bless us. And then when we bring that kingdom in, Jesus Christ will then show up and he'll be so happy and pat us on the back. As he will cast those Jews off into hell, eternity, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 12, 6 and 7. That's why they will explain this verse. That God is all through, according to the scriptures, with the Jews. And he's not. You got to rewrite the Bible. Throughout your generations that ye may know that I am the Lord that does sanctify you, set you apart. Those Jews are set apart. Oh, wouldn't it, a high-minded Greek who seeks after wisdom, wouldn't he love to have God's apple of the eye upon them and their church organization and their group of people? Wouldn't you just love to say, God, you know, yeah. But you know, Gentiles are nothing. You know why Gentiles are really getting saved today in the church age? Because God is angry in the Jews. You didn't want it? I'll go to those dead dogs. Look at Jonah and Peter's, uh, when God told him to go to the Gentile. Ew. Really? You shall keep my Sabbath, therefore, for it is holy unto you. Everyone that defiles it shall surely be put to death. Do you think that's happening in congregations that believe on the Sabbath? Now, if they got upset about the apostles, I don't know which ones they were, this side, that they're in the cornfield rubbing corn between their hands and eating wheat or barley, whatever it was. 
Do you think they would have a problem with putting your, putting your key in your car and starting it and driving to church on a Saturday? Wouldn't you think that'd be a problem? Wouldn't you think it'd be a problem that you would go and turn the stove on to, to, to have a meal? Go back to the manna. God says you prepare that on the sixth day for the seventh day. No work, no fire. A guy, I don't know if we got to that one yet. I think he's still coming up. There's a guy collecting sticks on the, on the Sabbath day, and God says, kill him. And whosoever doeth any work thereon, that soul shall be cut off from among his people. I said, for a Jew, that's it, you're done. I bet you don't preach that in seven day whatever assemblies. Six days may work be done, but in the Sabbath is the Sabbath of rest, holy to the Lord. Whosoever does any work in the Sabbath day, he shall surely be put to death. That's not practice. America is 24 7. Capital punishment for working on the Sabbath. No, anybody who believes on the Sabbath today believes on that. How do you say that? I will tell you that there is a Seventh-day Adventist hospital that works on Saturday. Their nurses, their doctors, their uh, cafeteria employees, their chefs, and doing a little talk to it to find out that the church officials involved in all that group do not work. But their employers, the employees do. Really. You're okay with God, but everybody that works under you is not okay and can be damned by God by not doing the Sabbath. Really? You're a fool. Wherefore, the children of Israel, did you get that? Write that down. I-S-R-A-E-L. Boom. 1 Corinthians 122. The Jews seek a sign. Huh? Got it. Now I'm not one of those people, whatever Paul says, that's you know, that's that's better than the Ten Commandments. I'm not one of them people. But you do know that Paul does refute and explain to us to the carnal church about tongues and about signs. He tries to get that with those people. The difference that it's not for the church age shall keep the Sabbath deserve the Sabbath throughout the generations for a perpetual covenant it is a sign first Corinthians 1 you got tired of hearing that I have to say it between me and the children of Israel forever. There is no other Bible study needed. I think I will be safe to say. I'm just trying to think in my head here. I would assume that any fourth, fifth grade child in grammar school can read what I just read. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. Oh, oh, that's what the Sabbath's for. Children of Israel, when you do the Sabbath, you're going to remind yourself, on this day God made this, on this day God said that, on this day God with his mouth said let there be on this day God said let there be on this day God said let there be on this day there were elephants on this day there was man on this day there was a palm tree and then on the seventh day God rested from his work so what are the Jews supposed to be saying excuse me Jew Israelite why do you rest on the seventh day do you really want to know Yes, I'd like to know why you take a rest every seventh day. Because there's no such thing as evolution. God created the heavens and earth on the sixth day. On the seventh day, he rested. That's what we're doing. We are showing you that there's a creator of all the earth. How's that? 
That's what they're doing. That is what they're to say. That is the story. That is to be going through all the nations, those weirdos over there, with that one God. Do you believe they work for six days and they cannot work on the seventh day because God said, let there be, then let there be. And let... Do you believe that nonsense? They do. And God does. And so it was Ezra or Nehemiah, when they were coming on the seventh day, he said, I'm locking this place up. And if you come back here on the seventh day, I'm going to beat your butt. I'm going to drive you away. That's how serious it is. By the way, this is one of the sins that they do go into captivity. They do not honor this. And they were worshiping the stars, the host of heaven, instead of the creator. They forgot that the creation was made by a creator. Now, if you were sitting down on the seventh day, and you, you, there's nothing to do, and you're sitting in your living room in your house, and you're talking with your children, and you talk about God the Creator. There would be no nonsense to have the hosts of heaven and reading your horoscope in whatever newspaper they had. Because I would say, Dad taught us that God created everything. That seventh day was because God created everything. That would be embounded into their mind. And if you don't think so, how long has the school system of America, the public school system, and the educated system of college and all that, how long have they been teaching evolution and look at the fruits that evolution is doing on the streets of America today? Because you left God the creator. Rested and refreshed. And he gave unto Moses, now watch this, and he gave unto Moses, when he had made an end of communing with him upon Mount Sinai, it's done. The 40 days, the 40 nights are over with. Mount Sinai, two, tab two tables of testimony. We call that a tablet today. You go to the store, you buy a pack of paper. It's bound, it's, that's what you call a tablet. But these are stone. As a tablet, these stone things would be very hard to swallow for. All have sinned, come short of glory to God. You imagine your average Baptist church having to read the chapters we've been reading and doing what you have to do according to the law. Can you imagine your church following after that? There's no way. Tables of stone written with the finger of God. Moses wrote Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Them ten stones that we have right now, they're going to be broken. But those, right now, those ten stones that, that Moses is going to carry down that everybody makes a big joke about. Moses coming down the mountain, he's got those tables of stones. They were written with God's finger. Now let me tell you about God's finger real quick here. Daniel. A king is having a beer October fest. <laughs> Holding out his, 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 his lager to get drunk and have a merry fest. With all that has been taken from the tabernacle. Remember he ordered? Bring the stuff in the tabernacle so we can get drunk by the gods of wood, gold, and silver and all that. For our gods and the hell with that God. And God's finger wrote upon the wall of the plaster. And Daniel came in and said, you're done. And he was done. And then the Pharisees come up to Jesus. With a woman caught in an act that they were involved in. And they questioned. That's not what we're talking about. And the Bible records that he stooped down and wrote something in the ground. You know what he had to write with? His finger. The Bible says his finger. God, Jesus is God. Jesus wrote in the ground with his finger. All right, right now we're going to read that these tables of stones are going to be broken by man. Babylon on the wall destroyed eventually gone 
who knows where that is. When Jesus wrote on the ground, when he was on this planet, no, it's been walked on, it's been kicked over, animals have gone on, it's gone. It's an interesting lesson about the finger of God. And by the way, when you got the, uh, I think it's the F4, 5, when you got a tornado that takes someone's life, they call that the finger of God. It's a little extra note there. <laughs>